Uh, my name is Brianna Toth, and I am a film preservationist at the Academy Film Archive in Los Angeles. So it's a pleasure to get to present to all of you about video, which is something I don't get to work with right now in my current job, and I, I really miss. Uh, I also want to thank Ashley and Dave, who um, encouraged me to submit something and present. Um, which I probably wouldn't have done on my own. So um, what I'm going to talk about is an extension of my graduate research that I've continued outside of school. And it really does touch a lot on a lot of the issues that we've been talking about. For example, the round table last night about the transference of knowledge, but also I'm going to talk a lot about collaborations across disciplines. Um, to work towards preservation, which we've talked a lot about today. Peter talked about um, using the Raspberry Pi and like when he didn't have a remote control, and it was really wonderful to hear about some of those projects. So the issue that I'm focusing on is that with the technical knowledge to repair and maintain video playback equipment is aging out of the professional field. The ability to steward this equipment is also at risk but not often part of cultural heritage when we discuss it. What I argue is that these skills are often um, at risk as much as the carriers themselves, and that if we wish to continue our work with this medium, AV archivists, engineers, and technicians must mobilize to pass on technical knowledge from one generation and community of practice to the next. Uh, I want to pause here and say that nothing I'm going to talk about is probably very new to any of you, but my point is that this is a persistent and unresolved topic, which does still need our attention. So I want to give you an idea of the context of where my thesis is coming from. Again, this might not be new, but just so that you can understand the limits and constraints of what I will be discussing. So the core tenant of a lot of this is that all moving image media is dependent on playback equipment. And although knowledge obsolescence is not specific to analog video, which is the only format I will be discussing, um, this, that it will just be the focus of this presentation. So as we know, all existing analog video formats are obsolete, and none are considered a preservation format. The second point is that the lifespan of the media is, it was not built to last. A lot of it was made for the commercial market, and the deterioration is irreversible and inevitable. So I think of this as a fugitive medium. Third, none of the playback equipment is new. It's made from fragile and delicate parts that are prone to malfunction and require routine maintenance which all contribute to this sort of grim trifecta we see here, often referred to as the magnetic media crisis, um, which essentially is the marriage of the limited time left we have to preserve these tapes before they are completely unplayable, the dependency on obsolete playback equipment, which has implications that the content is irrevocably tied to the preservation of technology, and that without the preservation of that technology, these historical documents cannot be salvaged. <laughs> In addition to the sheer volume of material on tape formats that far outweigh the resources to tackle the available, to tackle the backlog. So although uh, the year does vary depending on who you talk to, it's generally agreed upon that we have about 10 to 15 years until the majority of magnetic media will be unplayable and not able to be preserved. So how did this happen? When I originally made this PowerPoint, I had just seen this film, so very fresh in my mind. Um, basically, I'll refer back, and I, I cite heavily Mike Casey, who wrote an article in 2015 entitled, Why Media Preservation Can't Wait, The Gathering Storm, where he combines degradation and obsolescence to these bullet points we see here. And I'm not going to read them to you, but essentially what this means is that there's no tech support. There's no parts being made, and there's no technicians being trained as they used to be. So I also would like to add that a lot of these skills are now being folded into the job of the archivist, regardless of how we were trained or if it's relevant to our, our training at all. So when I was thinking about this issue, I wanted to begin 
um, to see you know, what, had be done, what had been done. Can hindsight give us any insight? So I started compiling a list of just every instance I could find that related to knowledge obsolescence, related to analog video decks. And I started feeling like the list was becoming a little unwieldy and maybe just a, a paper document wasn't the best format to keep this kind of record. So I made a timeline vis visualization of everything I found. And hopefully this video will play. Um, so on the timeline, uh, this includes conferences, task forces, projects, grants, reports that are all color coded by category. Um, the time span goes from 1978 to the present and currently contains 49 instances. And anyone can submit an instance, and you could as well from my professional website. Um, I would like to thank Ashley Bluer and Linda Tadic, who also contributed to this timeline. I was very grateful for their input. Um, but I should note that in an effort to keep this equipment focused, lists of resources like carrier-specific publications and media archiving degree programs and certificates were handed over to the EMEA Continuing Education Advocacy Task Force and included as appendices in a report that I helped them write and submit this year. So, oh, I skipped a slide, sorry. So uh, I really like to think of this timeline as a data set or a literary review, um, if you're thinking of this in sort of um, a methodology context. And what can be gleaned was, uh, I thought, three main points. Um, and one is that there was an emphasis on physicality. So there was, I did feel like there was a lot of knowledge transference related to the chemical makeup of magnetic tape um, and at attempting at one point to try to find a video preservation format, cleaning techniques, proper storage standards, and video error identification. Um, there was also a huge push towards cataloging standards. In the 90s, this was believed that documentation was the first step towards preservation and would assist with record sharing and be more competitive with grants, specifically those that were film related. Playback equipment it was also mostly absent. Um, if included, it was a brief mention or footnote, and the main focus remained carrier and object specific. So the five instances that I could find that I felt were focused on analog video playback equipment were the 2005 Artist Instrument Database by Mona Jimenez, which actually led to the next instance in 2008, the IMAP Obsolete Video Playback Equipment Project. Um, there's also, in 2012 and 2014, Michael Angeletti's EIAJ Refurbishment Project, which also inspired the BAVAC All Hands on Deck proposal that was submitted to the NEH, which Ben Turkis was part of, along with Kelly Hayden and Lauren O'Connor. And in 2019, um, actually quite recently to when I was doing this research, UNESCO uh, just launched a magnetic tape alert project. However, the only survey conducted that specifically addressed video playback equipment is from 2008, and that was the IMAP Obsolete Video Playback Equipment Project. Uh, it had several potential projects for the future that it wanted to gauge interest for. The first was a creation of a template that could be used to help inventory and catalog such equipment, which actually was, was made. That is the Artist Instrument Database. Um, the second was an online registry of playback equipment. And the third was a cooperative effort to share parts and expertise. However, the other two projects uh, were never materialized after the report was published. Um, so another thing that I drew from the timeline was case studies. You know, like specific things that people had done, like can, can we model some solutions after this? So I'm going to discuss two of those briefly. The first approach is one that we're all pretty familiar with, and that's mentorship with hands-on technical proficiency and getting under the hood. And the instance of that that I would like to give is, again, Bayback's All Hand on Deck NEH proposal, um, which involved a 30-hour training curriculum that was going to be integrated into audiovisual preservation workflows 
and education programs for VTRs, as well as a hands-on training workshop with 10 audiovisual archivists who would go back to their institutions and train their staff. And third, to developing an online resource that would make the curriculum freely available and assist with maintenance and repairs of BTRs. However, I should say this grant was never funded. It was submitted twice to the NEH and then again last year to the Knight Foundation. So the pros and the cons. So obviously it's thorough, it works, it's been done a lot. The knowledge keepers in our field that really have the most skill learned this way. Um, the cons, it cannot be applied on a large scale with the time the proficient training requires, and the skilled techs qualified to teach are diminishing in number. Also, the sheer volume of material needed for preservation overshadows available time and labor. So, moving on to the second approach, which is sort of the other side of the coin, bottom-up strategies and large-scale migration and digitization, which I thought was personified by Indiana University Bloomington's Memnon Sony Partnership, which is an academic and corporate partnership, so it's rather unique. Um, basically, they started the Media Digitization and Preservation Initiative, which is spearheaded by Mike Casey, who I mentioned uh, previously. He's their audiovisual director of technical operations. And what this project is doing is focusing attention on migrating content from legacy formats, whether it be onto new tapes or digitally transferring content to another. So it's not about transferring skills, it's just about transferring the actual physical thing. It started in 2013, it's still going on. Uh, the goal was to transfer 350,000 significant media holdings by 2020. I don't know where they are on that. When I checked in June, they claimed they were 96 percent finished, but then I couldn't find any more statistics, so I don't, I don't know exactly where it's at at this moment. So the pros and cons of this, obviously again, it works, it's happening. Um, it, another pro is that it marries the interests of industry and archives, and hovers between motivations of preservation and profit-driven profit -driven production, where proprietary knowledge can be more freely shared. The cons? It's difficult to replicate, um, again, reconciling this tension between commercial interests of a company and preservation priorities of smaller collecting institutions that may not have as much material to migrate as uh, the in Indiana University is difficult to find. Um, in addition, companies don't want to create competition by providing more service provide service centers. So although uh, Sony Minon created a huge digitization center, they don't really want to create another one because they would be competing with themselves and basically uh, cannibalizing like their profit. Um, another con is that the specificity of this relationship would be really difficult to replicate. Um, there are really unique circumstances that made this project possible including institutional support from the provost, um, surveys that began in 1998 to the present that assessed all of their holdings and created a task force. And also, they had full support and cooperation from their IT department when they were creating all of their workflows. So I just wanna say, I think both of these case studies, um, they, they do work and they, but they have cons, but I don't think either of them would work by themselves. I think that we need to be a lot more creative when thinking about this problem. And I think that there's a lot of questions that need to be answered that are centered around scalability, such as every institution's resources vary along with their collections and those collections' needs. You know, what skills do we need now? We've assessed it in the past, but what are they today? And on what platform do people want to share this technical knowledge? So I designed uh, a survey uh, to ask these questions because I wanted to know. Um, the link is up there. I also have the link that I can give you. But it will be widely distributed in January. Um, and I believe this survey allows the inclusion of multiple voices from different generations to provide an accurate understanding of knowledge obsolescence and contribute to a more nuanced understanding of what our current preservations are by including playback equipment and technical skills and cultural heritage. But I didn't stop there. So in designing this survey, I went back to my timeline um, and 
I just, I just really believe that we don't have to reinvent the wheel just because things didn't work. I still think a lot of the work that people did in the past is really important and we can build on that. And I also think that that work really needs to be acknowledged and that we can't just have this like all or nothing attitude where that's a bad idea, it didn't work, so we can't use it. So um, I looked at two specific instances that I drew upon in designing these questions. And the first was again, the Bayback All Hands on Deck grant proposal. Um, and what I found really unique about this proposal is that they were the only ones in all of the material I came across that actually listed and defined the skills that they wanted to teach. In everything else that I found, um, people stress the need for skills and training, but they can never elaborate on it or define it. And then I also went back to the MEAP survey from 2008 and was kind of thinking about, you know, like, how do we want to share this? What are the platforms? So as you can see, the apprentice models on there, workshops from BayVac, partnerships from IU, um, and then the survey. One of the big takeaways is that 81.3% of the respondents said a co-op for spare parts would be a beneficial future project. At the time, they thought that, vend that they could work together with vendors to reproduce parts or purchase them in quantity to negotiate or reduce costs, which I don't know if that would be the best thing to do now, but I, I do think that we should revisit that possibility of if we should have a co-op or a consortium. And then the last few things that you see up here, in addition to this research, I conducted 18 different surveys, so these other potential options were things that people mentioned when I was talking to them. Also, there's just one of me. I have no research team to help me. This is something I've been researching for a year and a half. So, you know, my, my means are limited. So a lot of the information we need to make the survey meaningful, I don't actually have the resources to do. But I think we can comp continue to build on existing reports that focused on statistics of analog media within various collections, like the amount, institutional resources, preservation needs, and build upon them or at least get an idea so I also say this because knowing which formats dominate collections holdings are significant since technical skills and equipment are often format specific. Which formats are currently in collections in need of preservation and without available resources or expertise can help us understand which urgent skills, what skills are most urgent to pass on since we probably can't do it all. Um, as I said before, the all hands on deck grant proposal was submitted three times. Um, and what's bittersweet about that is that although it was never funded, I can work off the feedback of the program directors. So I did speak with Morgan Morrill, who's BayVac's preservation manager, and he went over all the questions that were discussed with him and how he thought maybe some of that could be addressed. And, you know, I have them here. Again, I'm not going to read them to you, but, um, you know, how does throwing more people in the mix help? Would this involve job creation, your target audience, et cetera? So basically what I hope my survey will do is that it will map format-specific preservation priorities and trends. You know, are they geographically specific or concentrated? Um, what volume of material is at risk? Um, are larger collections that we know of have they already preserved all of their preservation priorities? Um, and then can we strategically match resources, skills, and needs? Because I really think that's the only way that we can tackle this problem is by pooling what we have, but we have to know what's out there. Um, and to use these results modularly, because I think every case is gonna be really unique, it's really not gonna be a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, and cater to the multiplicity of institutions and collections to adapt to the scalability of their various situations. Thank you. Thank you, Brianna. Um, do we have anyone else who hasn't spoken yet today who has questions? Actually, I have a question. Sure. Um, so I don't work much with video, but a lot of this is relevant to the work that I do with audio as well. And um, one thing that I've thought about as a barrier to training my own staff or even training um, incoming staff, uh, interns, for et cetera, uh, for example, um, is um, like you don't want them to tinker with the like 
one of three machines <laughs> that you have available. Um, and so even for um, an institution like mine, I work at, a, at an EDCC and we're a vendor, basically. Um, even when we have grant funding, for example, to buy more equipment, um, we, I know exactly who I'm competing with to, pur to purchase that equipment, and it's often like larger vendors or institutions that have money, and um, we're just like bidding against each other on eBay for the same thing, and it comes down to whoever <laughs> like has the most, most money and stayed up until 1 a.m. to get it. Um, so it's made me think a lot about the distribution of where the equipment actually ends up, and this idea of sort of like hoarding equipment, like I think all of us want to do that because you want to have a, like a room full of all your backup equipment. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but like even at my institution, there's, there's um, a challenge to that. Like we don't have a room full of extra playback decks. Um, <laughs> we have like a, a, few, a few extras. So I wonder if there's some way of understanding, um, uh, some of the way that we can, can pool our resources in a way to understand where, um, if, you know, if you need to buy something, it's yeah. Maybe not from, you know. I mean, I think that's the goal of the survey. I'm sorry if I didn't explain it very well. It just I was trying to cram a lot in, but it does ask questions like, what are the formats that you have? Do you have equipment? Do you have trained staff? And so the idea is that if enough people respond, you know, maybe you have parts to something, but that's not your preservation priority. Or maybe you have some, but there's not enough of it to make it a motivation, but there's five other institutions that have a similar preservation priority, then you can actually combine those needs together and maybe get it done. Yeah. So that's kind of the idea is that you can, if it can be mapped, then things can be strategized. But without having any sense of what you have to work with, you can't actually do that. And I don't think it's, I don't, I'm really against people working for free. Like I know that like everyone's like, do it for the love, whatever, it's great. I mean, do what you want in your spare time. But you know, I think it's, I think it's crucial that if you do want to you know, incorporate people that are trained or older engineers, that you do respect like, the skills that they have or find something. And that just expecting somebody to train somebody in addition to the job they already have and how much they're working is not an option. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to somebody who hasn't had a chance to speak yet. Konstantin Wiesinger, uh, Saxon State Archive. Uh, thank you for that wonderful presentation. And two, or one thing where I think that, uh, that it's really necessary because uh, regularly I stumble upon small institutions or uh, production companies who come, go out of business and they regularly throw out their VTRs or playback equipment and we didn't have the chance yet to uh, um, accumulate it. So that uh, is totally approved for me that this is necessary, such an initiative. And just a quick question, do you also target with your survey uh, European or German uh, archivists? Because that would be of great help, I think. Yeah, I think it's as big as people want it to be. Um, I think the challenge is really getting enough respondents to make it a meaningful survey. Uh, one of the surveys that I'm actually partnering with is um, a survey that actually took place last year. And it was um, a group of students, but they ended up only focusing kind of by accident, because it's where they work, on academic libraries. And so we had been in dialogue with that. We were both kind of interested in the same thing, but that their survey was really focused and very much supported by um, SAA, the Society of American Archivists. So we really wanted to pool our, resorts, our resources and our results and really like, see what we could get like, together. Um, I think it is key to get smaller institutions because I think originally when I was thinking about this survey, I was thinking of places like Stanford or even like UCLA where I, I feel like their main preservation priorities for the most part might have already been taken care of, that this might not actually help them that much. Um, and that I think it's also crucial to not just get the survey out to um, the field of archivists that deal with media, but just general archivists, where there might be something in their collection, but they're not an AV archive. Thank you, Brianna.